with uh, <laughs> Dr. Tarek Hassan from the CMAT, who will be talking about two layers of resolution astronomy with uh, imaging atmospheric check sharing of telescopes. Uh, uh, Tarek will be properly introduced by Google. Okay, well, so Tarek, uh, I met him uh, many years ago. We started actually the PhD at the same time. He did the PhD at the University of Computer Madrid, working for the, for the CPA consortium. And uh, then he moved to E5 for a postdoc. Uh, he got a Juan de la Sierra uh, fellowship over there and, uh, for a couple of years, and then moved to DESI, uh, where he did a three year postdoc working in Veritas, that is another imaginary chunk of telescope, to come back later to CMA in Madrid, in which he got uh, one of these uh, Atracción de Talento uh, fellowships. And uh, well, uh, he also, <coughs> since uh, a few months ago, he, he was uh, awarded uh, with an ERC starting grant called MicroStars, if I'm not, uh, <laughs> if I'm not uh, wrong on the name, <laughs> and uh, that he will be starting in, in a few weeks. Right. Yes. And uh, well, we invited him uh, here today because uh, Tarek, apart from the from the general expertise that he has in gamma ray astronomy and imaging atmospheric channel of telescopes, that she also has a, 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 some uh, expertise in uh, optical astronomy doing, uh, uh, being done with these uh, telescopes. And this is what uh, he will be talking about, uh, about uh, today. So please, Tarek. Uh, thank you, Ruben. So I hope everybody can hear me well. I'm Tarek, nice to meet you. Um, Okay, so IACTs means Imaging Atmospheric Cherekov Telescope, so these magic telescopes that we have. Uh, and I will be talking how can this telescope perform sub-millier second uh, um, measurements uh, in several ways, okay? So uh, please bear with me. I will be talking about some topics that probably many people here know more than me. So uh, if I say something wrong, I apologize. Um, okay, so you're probably aware that stars are enormous. Okay, so um, <laughs> it's it's good to 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 begin at at, at my level. So um, so yes, stars are big, but they are very far away. Okay, so uh, the relative distance between stars is enormous. Therefore, um, uh, the actual angular size of individual stars uh, is actually really really small. Okay. Um, and knowing how small these stars are is actually very important for astronomy. Okay, so um, so <coughs> having a direct measurement of, of the actual uh, size of stars allows uh, rather than direct a, a, a measurement of the luminosity, um, and and this is actually very used about in in many uh, fields of astronomy. So especially uh, on on <coughs> ensuring that the stellar models that we use are correct. The only way, actually, stellar models are, are, are fitting actual measurements. So, so we need those measurements in order to ensure that the, that the stellar models that we use in many fields in astronomy are right, okay? So other very obvious uses of uh, measurements on, on stellar diameters uh, um, are, uh, right now, a hot topic are uh, reconstructing the physical parameters of exoplanets, no? So, so when we see a transiting exoplanet, we know very well the properties of the star, then we can actually uh, improve a lot the, the, the transiting exoplanet analysis and therefore infer, um, infer uh, stronger conclusions over the, the physical parameters of, of planets. Uh, but when we talk about milliard second resolution, what, what do we really mean with that? So, so these are very small units, no? So I always start by assuming that the planet is, is flat and uh, just imagine uh, uh, that you are staying in New York, looking to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, okay? So um, if someone was holding a two euro coin at the top of the Eiffel Tower, that would be one milliard second as seen from New York, okay? This means that one milliard second is something very small, very, very small, okay? Um, and if now we stop talking about uh, Paris and we start talking about astronomy, then uh, uh, the usual angular scale of the objects that we, uh, when, that we see when we look to the sky. So the sun and the moon are roughly the same angular size, which is roughly on the, on the tens of arc minutes, okay? 
uh, then the local planets and are at the tens of arc seconds. But then, apart from local planets, already the largest stars are already measured in milliard seconds, okay, in tens of milliard seconds. But when you look at the sky, most of the stars that you see with your eyes, they are already in the milliard second level, okay? So either milliard second, of course, some of them will be larger as, as the ones that I'm showing here, but the typical size of a star of the very bright ones are milliard seconds and obviously below, okay? And much smaller uh, angular diameters, okay? And this is a figure that I will be showing many times during this talk. Uh, it's a complex figure um, because it, it shows both radio and optical and in the y-axis, uh, the, the angular resolution that the different instruments in the field have, okay? Uh, I'm sure many people here have experience with radio, uh, radio uh, interferometers, but here, for example, you can see uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, the resolution that is reaching, reaching the tens of mil, uh, mi micro arc second resolution. Uh, you can see that the, the EVN VLDA network is here, and uh, you can see VLA, uh, ALMA, et cetera, but here, uh, starting at the, at the center of this plot on the left, uh, now we are talking about optical interferometers, okay? So you can see here Chara, VLTI, these are the famous ones. Um, I'll be showing this plot a lot just for you to be, uh, uh, to, to, to put our results in, in, in this context, okay? So uh, the message that, that I want to send through is that uh, Cherenkov telescopes are actually capable of performing submilliard second resolution measurements and we have been able to do it in two different ways. First, interestingly, by measuring asteroid occultations, and second, using these telescopes as optical intensity interferometers. Okay. So first, I will introduce very generally what are Cherenkov telescopes, but also seen as, a, as an optical astronomer, right? So um, here, for example, there is a, a, a picture of of the of the first. Uh, uh, large size telescope prototype, which is LST1. Uh, here you can see that the camera was not installed there. there. This is an old photo, but you can see that the that the structure of this of this telescope, the the big refle reflecting dish, the arc holding the camera, etc., is really not that different as, for example, uh, here the, there is a sketch of Sub the Subaru telescope. It's really really not that different. Okay, the Subaru. I'm specifically using the Subaru telescope because. It's a telescope that has actually a, a, a slot for having a camera in the in the in the primary pole. Okay, so um, Cherenkov telescopes are generally used to to this. I mean, you have probably seen many seminars about this. So so this they are used to actually study the very high energy regime. Okay, so in the electromagnetic spectrum, they are focusing on the very highest energies of gamma rays. And uh, uh, how do they do it? So when these gamma rays hit the atmosphere, they produce a shower of particles. And these particles, they emit Cherenkov radiation because they actually go faster than the speed of light in the medium. But this Cherenkov radiation is blue. Therefore, Cherenkov telescopes are optical telescopes. Here you can see an example. This is MAGIC, this is HES, this is VERITAS. And they are all measuring blue optical photons. OK, so they are optical telescopes. Um, the only, quote, quote, only, which is enormous difference, but the only difference is that uh, normal optical telescopes, they, are, they focus on directly measuring the photons that they want to study, like galaxies, uh, uh, spectra, etc. Uh, while what we do is study uh, the sources that we study indirectly, okay? So we record these blue flashes of light that, that last few nanoseconds, and then we reconstruct the original gamma ray uh, um, uh, and its direction, its energy, etc. So, um, but the, what what makes Cherenkov telescopes what they are is the fact that they are optimized to measure these nanosecond scale blue flashes instead of optimizing it to to actually have excellent angular resolution to to reconstruct the galaxies, etc. So, Cherenkov telescopes are optical telescopes with the only tiny difference that they are optimized to measure nanosecond scale blue flashes of light. So this is an example of a Cherenkov telescope. This is Veritas. So, so I apologize because now I'm a magic member and many people here are magic members. 
But um, this is just an example of what a chain of telescope is. They are large. They are actually very large in, di in diameter. The Veritas telescopes have 12 meters in diameter. Magic has 17 meters in diameter. And the large size telescope that I showed before has 23 meters in diameter, OK? Uh, the, the, their field of view is enormous. Uh, how enormous? You can see it in the next slide. So these are the kind of images that we record. This is a Cherenkov shower, OK? so so. These are the kind of images that we that we take and that we reconstruct its, its direction, its energy, etc. But to me, the interesting thing as an optical astronomer is that roughly the size, the angular size of these images is comparable to the size of, of, of Andromeda, of M31. No? So again, if we go back to, to the Subaru telescope, we can see that the Subaru telescope on a single snapshot is also able to take the full Andromeda galaxy. Okay. And of course, the Subaru telescope costs uh, so, <laughs> like two orders of magnitude more than our telescopes. Um, uh, and, and, and you can see it in the image. No? Uh, so roughly, the image that we would see is something like this. I actually computed this properly. So I, I did a Gaussian smoothing. And this is what, what a Cherenkov telescope would actually see with our very large pixels. So we have very large pixels and a, a very bad optical quality. The bad optical quality means that our telescopes are cheap and therefore we can make them very big. So um, a few technical details about, the, uh, about our telescopes. So we use uh, photomultiplier tubes, which are uh, the pixels that we can use to actually measure nanosecond scale flashes, right? Um, so this, um, the, uh, the electromagnetic showers that we want to record are not super bright. Therefore, we need very large telescopes to actually in, uh, being able to collect enough photons during the short bursts of light that we that we go for. No? Um, but no high angular resolution is needed. So the, the, the mirrors that we use are actually not astronomical quality as those of the GTC or, or other optical telescopes. And therefore, they are much, much cheaper. So um, if you think of these telescopes as optical telescopes, they will never be able to compete with a, with a telescope equipped with a CCD card. Okay, so, so not only the, 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 the noise that you will get in, into that CCD camera is much better, and as our angular resolution is terrible, then we will never be able to compete uh, with CCD cameras. But there is a specific parameter space in which we do compete, and that is for very short observing times, okay? So, uh, as probably some of you know, uh, CCD cameras normally are not suited for, for millisecond scale measurements. Uh, we have, for example, in the Grand Tecan Hypercam, which actually allows you to go to the millisecond regime. Um, but this is rare. There are not many optical telescopes equipped with, with, with uh, uh, very fast CCD cameras. And the faster you go, the, the sensitivity starts to be limited by the scintillation nodes, okay? And scintillation is mainly uh, um, improved by having large telescopes. So our telescopes, even if they do not have CCD cameras, our photo, our photo detectors are not great as compared with CCDs. Uh, if we talk about very fast uh, 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 phenomena, then we start being competitive. Okay. So uh, I will briefly talk about asteroid occultations uh, <laughs> and, and how we use asteroid occultations to, to do submitted second measurements. Okay, so what is an uh, asteroid occultation? So you first need a star, you need an asteroid, and you need an observer from, from Earth. Okay, so when, when there is nothing blocking the view to, to, that, to that star, uh, uh, you are measuring a constant flux uh, of light. Uh, but when the, when the asteroid passes exactly in front of the star and between the, the star and the observer from Earth, then you, you, you see that, that, that the light from star is blocked. And the only uh, light that you see is that of the, of the asteroid. Uh, and of course, it is not in scale. And when the, when the asteroid moves away, then uh, you see again that the flux goes up. And these asteroid occultations can actually be predicted. So, so we know the ephemerides of the asteroids, uh, we actually compute what will be their path over the sky. And when they pass in front of a bright star, then it starts being interesting <coughs> for many reasons. No? Some of the reasons of why these events are interesting are this kind of uh, asteroid tomography. So, so, so if you have many telescopes along the shadow of the asteroid moving over the Earth, then you are able to reconstruct with very high precision the shape, the position of the asteroids, 
and uh, uh, this has classically been done by by amateur astronomers. So, um, but uh, um, there are results of, of actually very high impact, and, and people here at the uh, uh, IIA know this very well. So, so this is actually uh, uh, Jose Ortiz is from this institute. I don't know him, so I don't know if this is here, but. Um, but uh, um, sometimes these these events are extremely interesting. Okay, so so when when a Kuiper belt object passes in front of a star, then we can study Kuiper belt objects which are extremely dark, etc. Sometimes we find uh, uh, rings in in these objects uh, which have uh, um, strong implications in, in the in the formation process, etc. So uh, what what we thought for observing these events is that they are faster than, for example, planetary transits. And because they are faster, then we are more competitive. No? So, um, so yeah, these events are, are generally not followed by enormous telescopes. Uh, um, so, so uh, anchoring of telescopes are indeed very, very big. So, so they will provide good millisecond sensitivity, and we could see perhaps uh, atmospheric profiles, rings, or uh, something that we were not expecting. No? So, so for example, I can show you that this is the occultation that we were expecting for the first observation that we performed, and this is what we detected. Okay, so this is with Veritas telescopes, which are four different telescopes. Okay, so here you can see the ingress, so when the asteroid blocks the light of the star, and the egress, which is when the uh, <coughs> asteroid moves away. You can see here the, 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 the all this pattern is is. Uh, Maybe a bit less than a hundred milliseconds. Okay, so so this is something that occurs very fast, and and clear you can very clearly see a diffraction pattern. Okay, um, so so we knew that this would happen. Okay, so so this is something that that you expect. Um, but why do we see such a clear pattern? Okay, so so why is isn't the noise diluting this signal? So again. The main source for, for noise when you are observing very, very fast uh, optical measurements is scintillation, is the atmosphere. So you can imagine that, that uh, the light from a star is actually similar to the light on the, bo uh, uh, on a, uh, on the bottom of a pool, this typical pattern of light going up and down. So the larger your telescope is, the, the better the measurement of the average of light that goes inside inside your telescope, right? So, so the atmosphere does something very similar. So the larger your telescope is, the less scintillation you have. No? Um, also, having multiple telescopes allows you to measure the same thing as they are separated for 100 meters, then allows you to observe uh, the same thing because the, you are, they are not observing the same atmosphere, only the very, very higher atmosphere. Uh, and therefore, you have several independent measurements from the same thing. So this is the data that we got for the first occultation that we measured. As you can see, the, the error bars are super tiny. The, the, the data set was fantastic. And you can see that there is a difference between this blue dashed line and the, and the orange one. Okay, And the blue dashed line is the pattern that we would expect for a point like source. And the, and, and the one that we see in orange is the one that would come from a disk of 0 0.1 milliard seconds. So we are talking about a, a, a tenth of a milliard second. So it's something a tenth of a two euro coin in Paris as seen from New York. Okay. So this is something very, very small. And this was the first time achieved in the optical, as far as we know, maybe, maybe some old paper or something. Um, so you can see that all the measurements from the independent measurements that we took from independent telescopes agree very well. And uh, we repeated the observation. We saw another occultation. And again, we were able to, de to detect the angular diameter of a star, in this case, 94 micro -hour seconds. Okay? To put this into context, uh, again, measurements agree very well. And just to put this into context, the, the first shadow of a black hole that we measured, this is 50 uh, micro -hour seconds. And the star that we measured is this size. Okay. Of course, our resolution is not as good as the Event Horizon Telescope. Of course, I'm not claiming that. But just to say that this was achieved in the optical. Okay. This was a first. Um, so just for you to, to put things into context, here you can see the measurements from the Event Horizon Telescope, and here you can see the two measurements that we did with Cherikov telescopes. And this is the actual size of the spot size of those stars. Okay. So so. 
the, the optical PSF fast chain of telescope is this big, is the size of my fist. Uh, uh, while the measurements that we were able to do is seven orders of magnitude smaller. Um, so uh, the, the grant that I just got uh, plans to exploit this sens millisecond sensitivity for another scientific objective. No? So um, as we were talking before, that these asteroid occultations may be very interesting when you're observing Kuiper Bell objects. Um, the Kuiper Belt objects are the remnant of these uh, protoplanetary disks that we see in young stars. Okay, this is image in radio, right? for example, by ALMA, and we see that the that the planets are forming here. And when these systems cool down and evolve, we see uh, uh, something similar to our so own solar system. No? so so uh, here we have the planets that accreted most most of the of the of the asteroids in the inner region of the solar system, but the Kuiper Belt objects are a remnant of this, of this protoplanetary proto disk. And it did not undergo such a collisional history so that most of these asteroids were destroyed. Uh, this means that by studying the Kuiper Belt object, we may infer conclusions on, the, the, on how planets were formed, essentially, you know? so on how uh, objects start gathering material, etc. This is one uh, picture in which, it, they uh, in which I show the, the radius of the Kuiper Belt objects known, okay? Here we have many objects. So, so these are objects that are very far away from the sun. It means that they are not very bright. They are very, very, very dark, okay? They are not, of course, they are not hot. So, so therefore they don't emit, they barely emit light. They only reflect the light from the sun, but as they are very far from the sun, they, they barely emit any light, no? So here we have seen uh, detected many of them because they are large and therefore deep observations, you can actually measure them. But when you start talking about a small Kuiper Belt objects, we barely have detected some of them, okay? Most of these are upper limits, but these are a couple of uh, detections of uh, roughly kilometer scale uh, uh, asteroids, okay? Um, what our predictions seem to suggest is that by searching a bright star at the right location and waiting, simply waiting, uh, over tens of hours of observation, which probably the people uh, uh, having experience with Cherenkov telescopes know that it is not that much time. So normally our observations tend to go 50 hours per year and things like that. Um, so if you just wait, a tiny object of 100 meters, a Kuiper Belt object of barely 100 meters, would produce such a signal over the uh, over a magic telescope or over the LST1 telescope. Okay, this means that it seems reasonable to think that uh, um, uh, over reasonable observing times, if these telescopes had the uh, capability to actually perform clean, uh, fast optical measurements, then we would be able to put constraints on the sub kilometer uh, uh, population of Kuiper Belt objects, and this has implications on how the solar system was formed, okay? How planetesimals were generated. Is it okay if I interrupt you? Please do. Oh, so I see this is a ninth magnitude star, so absolutely fantastic. Of course, then I wonder about the statistics, but probably you're going to get there, right? Uh, which is statistics? Uh, of, of, I, I will not get deeper into this. So, but I guess you, get there, right? you mean uh, the statistics? If I point to a random ninth magnitude star, there's not many on the sky there. Oh, nice, nice, maybe a million or so. This is a star that I handpicked from Gaia. So, so this is a true star at the right location. So you picked this star and you knew something was going to happen or you just picked it and looked? I picked this star because its angular diameter is super small. This is an O star. You did not know that an occultation would occur. No, 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 no. Okay. no this is not data. This is a simulation. simulation. Sorry, 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 sorry. I, I wish this was data. The probability would be Exactly. That is something that we expect to happen over eight hours of observing eight time. Hours. Eight, ten hours. Of course, this depends. Do you want no, to sorry, it? So it depends on the sensitivity that we reach. And as, as, as we need to upgrade our hardware, then this is certainly not something. Yes. So, but if we reach the, the uh, to be, if we reach the point in which scintillation is not really an issue and we start being limited by the shot noise, and I remind you that as our pixels are very large, we are limited by the shot noise because we are in integrating a very large field of view, then we would expect, uh, if our theories are right and our formulas are right, to have one event per 10 hours. Wow. Okay, thanks. Why? Because we have several telescopes 
they are separated, and therefore you have independent measurements of this noise. No, so no, I'm not wondering about the noise technology, just about the, the, the probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Passing, mm. passing the star. Yeah, this is what's also my so because uh, that is my main thing. Because I mean, yes. I'm not worrying about the detection. I believe everything technically. Mm. I just wonder. I mean, are there so many equivalent objects around that you have a significant probability on a very large sky that one of these things? Right in front of the this, yeah, yeah, this strongly depends on exactly this. Okay, so if these detections are right, be aware that these are low uh, uh, significant detections. Okay, so so there have been several detections that have been hinting towards having a, a sub-kilometer equatorial object uh, slope that is roughly of of, of this. Uh, this factor Q, this is a Q roughly a uh, value of I think, like four or two. What is uh, the Cian line? This one, I, I will explain it now, yes. So this Cian line is the population of Kuiper Belt objects that you infer from uh, the cratering records of uh, far away uh, minor planets. So this blue line, uh, by imaging the surface of Charon, counting the amount of craters that they have and the size of the craters, then you simulate it, and then you infer what is the population of a small objects. And there is a very clear difference between what you infer from the cratering records and what several experiments are claiming to detect. So to your question of the probability, if these experiments are right, and the, here we have a power law, then the lower, the lower objects you search for so the if you are sensitive to tiny variations in the in the in the in the flux of the of the light coming from the star, um, then you start having many events. If you, for example, if we only had GTC, then the 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 individual noise added by by the scintillation of a of a ten meter telescope then already dilutes that signal. But if you have several, you have excellent signal to noise, then you start getting to smaller and smaller objects, which become much, much more uh, frequent. Okay. Um, there are, of course, a thousand parameters that get into this equation, and therefore the, the uncertainty is very large. Okay. So, but what we believe is that by having a, a multi year proposal uh, observing good candidates of stars, then we would put upper limits that would essentially. Uh, put in question these measurements. The other method that we uh, have used to perform submillier second measurements is using uh, this chunk of telescopes, and this is a render of how uh, the Rocket de los Muchachos will look like after the CTA Observatory <laughs> North Array will be built. Um, and it just reminds you to, 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 to radio telescopes, right? So, so um, there is a technique that actually allows you to use this chunk of telescopes as interferometers, uh, very much like, for instance, uh, the ALMA telescopes here. So going back to this image that I've been showing again and again, uh, if you, we now focus on the, on the optical telescopes here, you can see Chara and you can see the LPI, but you can also see this NSII, the Narrabri Stellar Intensity Interferometer. Um, and I will be focusing on this one right now, okay? So maybe this is not needed, but let me give you a gentle introduction to interferometry. This is something very hard to understand. For me, I can barely understand it, but uh, it will be just very superficial. I know that many people here have experience with interferometry, so probably this is not needed. But the way that we generally explain what interferometry is, is very simple. Okay, you have individual telescopes. They have a set of independent qualities, but if they work together, and technically you are capable of making them work together, then they work as one and they improve their resolution. Okay, so here there is a, a, a sketch of the Keck telescope. No, each of them is a, a ten meter telescope, but when when you combine the light beams and, and they operate as a, as an interferometer, the the actual limiting the resolution that you have is that equivalent to of a eighty five meter diameter telescope. Okay, so. Interferometry allows you to break that diffraction limit of a single telescope and improve the resolution of the telescope. But uh, it has certain uh, problems associated, so it's not as simple. Um, but the, the main uh, explanation of how they work 
is essentially that these instruments, what they measured is an interference. They measured a very tiny signal that is uh, uh, hidden uh, in, the, in the electromagnetic waves that, that different telescopes uh, detect, okay? So the way in which you measure this interference, it's very different in radio, in optical, and in optical, there are several ways of, of, of doing this, no? Uh, but something important to remember is that uh, some information is lost in the process. And, and for, in our case, most of the information is lost in the process. Um, so as I was saying, there are several methods to measure this interference. And optical interferometers, what, what they currently do, all optical interferometers right now in the world, or most of them, um, they physically combine the light, the light beams. Okay, So you have light coming from one telescope, light coming from one telescope. You physically combine them. And the interference seen uh, when combining those two, two light beams uh, shows the, what I'm calling here interference. Okay, it's much more complex than that, but please bear with that. Um, um, radio telescopes, as, as you probably know, they are only li linked ele electronically. And that's why they have been so successful because it's way, way, way simpler. So optical interferometers, they need to control the, the precision that they need on the whole path of the of the light, meaning like mirrors, uh, every single um, uh, um, reflection that you have of the of the light beam needs to be controlled with a fraction of a wavelength. Meaning that if you are observing blue light at three hundred nanometers, then you need to have a precision of tens of nanometers, and that is how, as you can imagine, and building a very 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 large optical interferometer, having it controlled the path of each individual photon uh, to a precision of tens of nanoseconds is expensive. That's the problem, that is very expensive. Okay, so this Narrabri Stellar Intensive Interferometer was actually the first interferometer ever built, which is funny. Um, and it's a te technology that was essentially lost. Why was it lost? Because it has some flaws, some problems that, that were not, uh, that were uh, too complicated at the time. But, but these were envisioned by Hambury Brown and, and Robert Twist. Twist, sorry, not Twist. And, and they uh, developed the Hambury Brown and Twist effect, which uh, is something very complicated to explain uh, related to the photon bunching of photons on their way to Earth. But just for, for, for you to see how these telescopes were built, they were 6.5 meters in diameter, quite large for the time. This was done in the 60s. Uh, and one very fast optical detector here, one photomultiplier tube, okay? Um, and the main difference between this interferometer and the optical interferometers that we were talking about is that they are only connected electronically. So the, what you are correlating is not the actual phases of the beam. What you're correlating is the evolution of light intensity versus time, okay? So it's a correlation in time. Um, and they were able to measure the angular diameter of 32 stars in the 60s, okay? And this was a great achievement. This was impressive, okay? But intensity interferometers had very strong limitations that essentially made this technique obsolete uh, and mm, cl now classical optical interferometers uh, started uh, improving the sensitivity of intensity interferometers and they dramatically improved them, no? So these telescopes have several problems. They require enormous reflecting surfaces because they need very, very high statistics of photons. And they require extremely fast electronics that at the time was extremely hard to achieve, okay? Uh, now it would not be a problem, of course. They have a strong inform uh, phase information loss. They, for those that know interferometry, they completely lose the phase information of the signal. They measure uh, V squared, the visibility squared, therefore any, any complex component of the, of the Fourier space is lost. But then they have some strong advantages over the classical optical interferometer, uh, interferometry, which is, as they are only connected electronically, you can have as many telescopes as you want, okay? Also, as separated as you want. Um, and also, they are insensitive to atmospheric turbulence. And this is a strong plus. Why? Because if you need to control, as I was saying before, the path of photons with a precision of tens of nanoseconds, the atmosphere itself is already adding that, that uh, it's already breaking the possibility of having excellent precision for blue photons. No? That's why generally optical interferometry is performed in the infrared 
or over long uh, base lanes, uh, over, over long um, uh, wavelengths. So generally in the red, okay? Um, okay, so how about IACTs? These telescopes really look like Cherenkov telescopes, okay? So um, in the case of Cherenkov telescopes, we already have enormous reflecting uh, surfaces. We already have them, okay? So we don't need to build any, anything complex. And the, the electronics are already at the gigahertz level. So, so the, the technical capabilities of our telescopes really match the technical capabilities of the Narabi telescopes in the 60s, okay? So um, our predictions originally was that with the magic telescopes, if they were able to perform intensive interferometry measurements, they would allow us to go farther into the blue. We would have similar resolution as Chara in the blue, and we would improve the sensitivity of the Narabri stellar intensity interferometry by a factor 10, okay? Just playing with the numbers, we should improve a factor 10, no? Um, but the truly exciting thing to consider is that if we actually demonstrate that this is possible uh, and, and we will be soon be building up to 100 telescopes in the, in the southern array of the CTA observatory, if these telescopes were slightly modified to actually allow these optical intensity interferometer measurements, you could have the first kilometer uh, scale optical telescopes of the world. No? Um, so the, all, also something quite interesting that I always find uh, very amusing is that these observations are possible under very high moon scenarios. Why? Because they have a very narrow optical filter, filter in front of them. So um, we would not even compete with the observing time of, of, of the gamma rays. So we would not harm the CTE observatory at all, while we could um, uh, answer many questions in the stellar astrophysics field. No? Um, how would such a telescope, uh, 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 what would be the resolution of such a telescope? So we would improve a factor 20, the resolution of Chara. We would go farther to the blue, but also something very important is that the UV coverage, this is the spatial scales that the interferometer would be studying, okay, would be so dense. So you would be uh, measuring so many different scales simultaneously that the, that the actual amount of detail that you would be able to reconstruct from, from stars would be enormous, okay? This is, of course, a simulation. And here, bear with me, this is ignoring the signal to noise. This is just showing what would be the, 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 the reconstruction of the sun, of our sun, if it was a, a 0.5 milliard second star, and uh, um, uh, every single correlation here had excellent signal to noise. This is not realistic. This is not a realistic simulation, but shows what kind of resolution we would achieve, which is incredible. Um, so is this possible? Uh, the, the answer is obviously yes, uh, because uh, we have already done it with, with magic. Okay, so in, in magic, we did a very rough modification of the, of the setup. So essentially we put here a very narrow optical filter in front of a single pixel of, of the magic cameras. Then we built a correlator with, with an oscilloscope, and then we did a fast publication in, in, the, in 2020. And we demonstrated that magic indeed reaches a sensitivity of a factor 10, the Narabi stellar intensity interferometer. How deep can you go? What's your stellar magnitude? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first question that people ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. So, so it's uh, right now. I need to apologize because uh, the the narrow stellar intensity interferometer was really, had really very strong limitations. Okay, so this factor ten seems amazing, but the the limiting magnitude roughly right now with only the two magic telescopes is roughly magnitude four in B. So it's really not that great. Um, uh, but the the thing is that the bottlenecks for improving this are very simple to, 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 to remove. No? So there is really a long gap of improvement. Okay? Um, so these are, for example, some preliminary results with a more uh, uh, mature setup that we have now. So, so this, all this hardware is already not used uh, in Magic. So we have uh, very much upgraded this. I did not bring uh, many pictures, etc., because it's not published yet, and uh, um, there will be a performance paper soon about this. Uh, but here are some preliminary results of these are the stars that we consider calibrators. So they were directly measured in the past, 
Um, and we are already reconstructing their diameter better with very short observing times. But also the, the, the stars that we, con that we call candidate stars, so those stars that do not have a direct angular diameter measurement, and, and at least the predicted diameter uh, uh, matches very well the angular diameters that we are reconstructing. Okay, so this is a very preliminary analysis. We are improving it every day. Uh, we are not stellar astrophysicists. We are not inter 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 interferometry experts. Therefore, we are advancing slowly. But uh, we are already seeing that uh, that the system works, okay? Um, so they are still not very sensitive, okay? So the limited magnitude is roughly a fourth magnitude. Uh, but MAGIC has demonstrated that these set of telescopes can indeed uh, become a competitive optical interferometers. And there is essentially no limitation to how many telescopes you can add to the... To the uh, there are even ideas of building the whole Roca de los Muchachos even with GTC, even with other optical telescopes, to actually put them within the network. No? So, so this is perfectly possible. Um, so these are already my conclusions after 40 minutes, um, which is um, we know that Cherenkov telescopes have achieved amazing things over the last 20 years as gamma ray telescopes. But interestingly, they are also competitive in, as optical telescopes in a very particular uh, time regime, which is for very, very fast uh, phenomena. Um, uh, 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 in millisecond timescales, um, they can be competitive. Uh, we, we are, of course, less sensitive, but the signal to noise that we may achieve is even better than the, that of, for example, of, of the Dante can with hypercam, if the object that you are studying is bright enough. And therefore, we believe that uh, it, they may be competitive for studying the subkilometer kuiper belt object population. But also, as optical intensity interferometers, they also may uh, um, dramatically improve the current generation of optical interferometers. We will never be as sensitive as, for example, of BLTI. It's impossible. We will never be as sensitive as them. But BLTI has, a, uh, has, a, a, has an angular resolution of 2 milliard seconds. If you want to go deeper, if you want to go to better uh, uh, angular resolutions, then you need telescopes that are much farther away. And building optical interferometers much farther away is very complicated and very costly. While these set of telescopes already exist, and upgrading them is not that complicated. Yeah, and uh, they actually have very interesting potential in the field of stellar astrophysics, mainly on the OBA stars because they are bluer and because our photosensors are blue. If we upgrade them, there is no nothing stopping us for going also to the to the red. But as generally, OBA stars are the ones that have a smaller angular diameter. Uh, these are the ones that are in our sweet spot, let's say. And this is all. Thank you very much, Tarek, for the comprehensive talk. And now, questions? Yeah, I would like to know which is the uh, fundamental precision that you can reach when you are, for example, doing some occultation that you have shown before. So can you go before to the slices where you were showing the, the transit or the occultations of the asteroids? So um, you mean what is the precision for actually the measurement? Well, you can translate this is, well, you can translate this in uh, photometric uh, precision to, to see which is the really magnitude you can see in the depth of this occultation, yes. so which is the limit that you have. So generally, uh, right now we are observing more and more occultations, and generally we stop observ observing them with the current setup and with magic, uh, okay, 12 magnitude stars. No, no, but they, okay. So 12 magnitude stars, the, the pattern that we see is already very noisy, and we assume that we will not really extract many conclusions. You mean, what is the minimal difference that we can actually yes, measure? Exactly. That's, that's that is very complicated to answer, because uh, the actual difference that we can measure over a millisecond time scales yes. that uh, we could, uh, I believe, in, we, we made a paper, for example, putting constraints on the optical emission of fast radio bursts. Mm -hmm. So these are millisecond emission time scales. And the limits that we put there are on the 13, 14 uh, magnitude level, but depending on the time length of the event. No, But mm -hmm. they are on the, on the 13, 14 magnitude level with magic. If you are, for example, the LST, those will significantly improve. Okay, um, uh, but for example, if you ask me what is the maximum 
difference in flux that we would be able to measure. But the minimum. The minimum, yes, the sorry. Minimum the, the, the minimum. Uh, um, uh, going from a stable flux to a stable flux is much more difficult. Why? Because what we are good is at actually the, the transient signal. Mm -hmm. But actually measuring a stable flux is very complicated for us because um, the, we have a certain degree of systematics on the amount of light that we measure in the camera, etc. We are good at uh, measuring uh, relative uh, fluxes, not, not so much like absolute fluxes. For, for example, for planetary transits, we are not that competitive. Why? Because even if, in theory, we should be able to be awesome, we would essentially need a different camera. We could think about building a, CC, a big CCD mm -hmm. that uh, uh, stored over longer time scales, and then we would start being competitive. Um, but with uh, photomultiplier tubes, we are not competitive. It's, it's very hard to, to, to measure a stable flux of photons. But with an exoplanetary we can say you should also be able to see the, 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 the shape of the transit. The deep, uh, yes, but it is much slower. For an exoplanet, planet, you would see it, you would see it, but it is much slower. Therefore, all the problems that our pixels have over long time scales, yes. you start eating them, and then uh, the calibration is is complex, it's complicated. Okay. But this is something that has not been really actually uh, uh, investigated truly. So actually, getting some people actually exploring this possibility is something that definitely would be worth. Actually, there is a paper. Uh, um, the, the, its title is uh, Cherkov Telescopes as, as the first. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, it, it was a paper done like 20 years ago by Brian Lackey, if I remember right, explaining what is the limit of, 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 um, of precision of Cherkov telescopes for, for actually measuring, for example, exoplanet transits. And in principle, it should be good. But I can tell you that with TMTs, it will be hard. Okay, so we can. We can forget about the idea of cover a full transit because it's not it's not that good but we can focus on particular points of the transit for example the address or the address to see to, to search for some particular features yes this and is, this could be certainly possible especially for those that are relatively fast okay. i would believe that it could be something that could be achieved mm -hmm. and and the and the noise sorry the noise that we would have coming from the atmosphere etc is very very small if the, the star is bright enough. Well, what about using other types of detectors like C and PMs instead of PMs? Or a CCD camera. Yeah. Just a CCD camera. Just put a big yeah. CCD camera. Or, or telescopes are equipped with uh, PMTs, but uh, the future ones, some of them will be equipped with silicon PMs. Yes. So have a lower noise. And... Yes. So, so maybe. Um, Maybe silicon PMs are, because silicon PMs, if you reach the photon counting regime, then uh, uh, in principle, it should be simpler to have like a, a mm -hmm. like an absolute flux. Um, uh, with photomultiplier cubes, there is this problem that we can, it's an, an, an analog signal that is that is hard to actually say how many photons you are measuring at which time. No? So, so you see this pulse, it may be one photon, it may be two photons. Uh, it, it is also possible if the rate of photons is very low, it is also possible to actually count, but with silicon beams is much easier. So, so that would certainly <coughs> be a possibility. Um, there's something I'm not sure I understand. Uh, you said at the beginning that the field of view of this telescope part is big. Right? So I'm not too sure where is that the integrated blocks in all of them? It's just one pixel. So we are not using the full camera. We are just focusing all the light. Uh, the best picture is probably this one. Um, so it's something very similar to this. It's just a single photomultiplier tube that is uh, um, channeling all the photons that we receive from a star. Okay, here you can see it. So this is uh, a set of optical filters that were done for performing moon observations in, 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 in for gamma ray observations, okay? So, so this is not related to our science case, but this uh, optical filter there is the one that we are using. So it means that we are not using the thousand pixels that we have in the camera, just one. Then with the mirrors, we focus all the light on a, on a single pixel and, 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 and then we do science with just that pixel. So 
you just channel the signal of that pixel, you channel the signal from another pixel of another telescope, and then you, you measure the time correlation that you have between between the the, 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 the yes so it's so in our case we can only do intensity interferometries so measure very fast how intensity evolves and then there's a tiny correlation uh, when you compute the correlation of the, of the two pixels yeah. yes. the angular size is not 3.5 degrees anymore but 0 0.1 degrees but it is like one exactly Okay, there are two questions in, in Zoom. Okay. Miguel Torres, please open your mic. Go ahead. Miguel, we don't hear you. Okay, sorry. Now we can hear you? We could, but no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have an okay. Uh, Miguel, are you still there? Okay, Benito, maybe Benito, you can open the microphone. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for the talk, Tarek. <laughs> Hello, Benito. <laughs> um, I had a question, I think you did mention, and it's basically, I think, my lack of fully understanding the system. But when you get the observations, uh, because especially for the Kuiper, you will be focused on the galactic plane, I imagine. Um, then, don't you have confusion many with many stars within the field? Like the signal that you capture is actually from many stars there? Yes. So uh, actually, the direction in which we need to look at is not the galactic plane, it's close to the ecliptic. Okay. So it's not exactly the same. Uh, and so there is a long list of uh, requirements for the candidate star to be ideal. Okay. So it needs to be in the anti-solar direction, because Kuiper belt objects are moving faster in that direction. Uh, I did all these calculations quite some time ago, so I apologize if I make a mistake. So it's essentially anti-solar direction so that the Kuiper belt objects are faster. Then the density of the Kuiper belt objects is higher, close to the Lagrange points of Jupiter. Therefore, it would be ideal if you observe into a given direction. Then it needs to be very close to the ecliptic within plus minus five degrees because the density of Kuiper belt objects will be higher there. So there are many, many constraints. But I can tell you that the, the ninth magnitude star that we found was quite clean, the, the environment, OK? Um, we could also go to a slightly brighter stars, but their angular diameter would be larger. And um, the, the, the signal that I was showing, as you can see, it's not a complete occultation. Why? Because the, the Kuiper belt objects at those distances, so a 100 meter object at 40 uh, astronomical units, does not block fully the light of the star. Okay. So, so what you would see is a tiny variation of the flux. No? So um, the smaller the star is, the more clear the diffraction pattern will become. So we have certain freedom on, the, on, on choosing a star. But this specific star that I found it is good enough as long as its angular diameter is what we predict. But of course, nobody can assure that, right? So maybe we would need an optical interferometer <laughs> that has a, a excellent resolution to actually put an upper limit on, on the diameter of this star, which is what I could have <laughs> if we upgraded Cherenkov telescopes <laughs> as it does in interferometers. No, it's just funny that there are these kind of synergies. But, uh, um, but yeah, Benito, it's on the ecliptic, not necessarily in the galactic plane. So uh, the confusion is not that enormous. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Benito, you can open your mic. Uh, do I understand correctly that the unit of equation is to be able to measure the sizes of stars? If the answer is yes, I understand. The observing mode now with the money data, especially in the future with CPA, will it be enough, right? And uh, you won't be given time to target sources. So um so the so there are two things that I explained, which is that we can perform angular measurements with our telescopes as optical interferometers, and then we don't need asteroid occultations. 
or we can also measure asteroid occultations to measure angular diameters, okay? Uh, uh, the question, will, are we still used doing it? Yes, so we have a proposal in MAGIC that actually allow us to, to follow these kind of events. How do we do it? As we predict when the occultation happens, then the observing time that we need on those occultation events are a few minutes, okay? So uh, uh, our proposal requires 10 hours of observation per year, and we follow roughly 10, 15 events per year. Uh, so it's really not a huge time investment, and as you compute when these occultations are going to occur, uh, the investment is really not that high. Also, it is, it is relevant to say that now with Gaia, the actual ephemerides of asteroids is improving dramatically. Therefore, the uncertainty on the time and on the actual occultations happening at all is really small. Therefore, this science case could be useful to measure the diameter of a specific stars. Which ones? The ones that are very hard to measure their diameter uh, through other ways. For example, the very cool stars, the K-type stars, are really, really hard to measure with interferometers. But uh, with, with this kind of occultations, it starts being possible. But I think maybe Miguel can correct me if I'm wrong, but he's asking whether you can perform the observ intensive interferometry observations while performing gamma ray observations. Ah, uh, I mean, you could, <laughs> but, you but, need, but uh, you have special setup, right? That uh, you need to. So, right now in Magic, we can do both very high energy and fast optical observations simultaneously, but when we target these stars, uh, normally there are no interesting very high energy targets there, and these stars certainly are not, are not very high energy gamma ray emitters. And therefore, we could perform observations simultaneously, but we are not lucky enough so that these targets are uh, interesting for very high energy uh, analysis. Uh, and the time investment that we need is so short, these events last seconds. So, so most of the observing time that we request is overhead. So, so it's just repointing there, etc. So, so it's it's a very small investment uh, that we lose uh, very high the observations. Okay. Okay. That, that's your question. Yeah. Um, so I understand that you are essentially limited now to measure stars because they are bright, compact, uh, and so on. So, but for the for the next generation of Cherenkov telescope, like uh, for example in CPAO South, provided that you have at least four LSTs, the big ones, uh, are there predictions about which limited magnitude you can achieve for sub-mega circular resolution? Just to see if, I mean, to know if, if you are going to be able to observe any of that. Yeah, so, so um, probably you're interested in extragalactic sources and extragalactic <laughs> sources. Very hard. <laughs> so the sensitivity that we right now estimate is on the seventh, eighth magnitude. Mm -hmm. And normally extragalactic uh, 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 sources are on the twelfth, thirteenth magnitude. No, normally in the in the visible, you no, know, in the in, in short wavelengths. Um, historically, there have been some lasers that reach relatively high uh, cities, but it would be very very hard to to observe such a thing. But there is hope. Why? Because uh, uh, if you actually thought about uh, using intense interferometry between enormous optical telescope, you could imagine ELT and VLT <laughs> doing interferometry together. Classical optical interferometry would be madness, would be so expensive. And these telescopes are not built for that. But uh, with intense interferometer, you really just need uh, to synchronize signals and, and fast optical uh, uh, photomultipliers or, or any photodetector that is ultra fast. So um, it's perfectly possible. So it's the technology that we are exploring, the one that would allow you to have a measurement of the broad line region of places and things like that. But this is only adding larger collecting surfaces on the telescopes, right? On the, if you use larger baselines. So, meaning, so the CTA South has the problem that our pixels need to be very large because the optical quality of the mirrors is very large. No? Mm -hmm. So, when, when you start going to the beyond, for example, the eighth magnitude, then you are 
all, the, the night sky background is already as bright as the signal that you're getting from the stars. So then you're adding a lot of noise. And going be, beyond that noise is really, really hard. No? But if you were using an actual optical telescope with, with optical quality, uh, then the 100% of the photons that you would be measuring would be coming from the, from the star. Doesn't matter that you go to, to a magnitude 8 or a magnitude 13 or a magnitude 15. So the predictions are actually very optimistic when thinking about enormous optical telescopes um, uh, using this interferometry because essentially 100% of the photons would be signal and therefore it would be much easier to find that correlation. Um, I was thinking about an alternative. Let me know if it's a crazy idea, but uh, perhaps somebody thought about that before. Imagine an already uh, classical optical interferometer like DOT mm -hmm. uh, with uh, yeah, a number of uh, uh, Cherenkov um, telescope like uh, around. Would it be possible to combine uh, uh, classical optical interferometer with uh, intensity interferometer so that you can have the sensitivity and also the high angle resolution? So you can combine them at the higher level, meaning that you can combine observations from one, observation from the other, and they are covering different ranges in the UV plane. Mm -hmm. But um, a, di a direct combination of the signal itself, as what you are measuring is different nature, yeah then uh, it's not possible. But something interesting of what you said is, for example, VLTI is made of a system of telescopes, some big ones, some small ones. Now VLTI is exploring to use intensity interferometry as you can do it simultaneously between all telescopes at the same time as, it, as, as the a given set of telescopes are performing optical interferometry uh, combining physically the light beams. So the other optical telescopes on the VLTI system of all the support telescopes, etc., could be simultaneously performing intensive interferometry observations for free because those are simply not used uh, when you choose your, your array of telescopes for performing optical observations. So um, intensive interferometry observations is something that optical telescopes are now considering to of performing, um, but setting of telescopes have this limit of the, of the, they will never go like to 14, 15 magnitude. That's it. That is really, really hard to think of. And mm -hmm. uh, what I would probably see easy, easier is to improve our signal to noise for those targets that we can observe easily. No? So for those stars of, uh, at six or seventh magnitude to, to reach excellent signal to noise, to really reach, uh, to a lot of detail within those specific uh, class of sources. Mm -hmm. That is something that I see easier technically. Sorry, a follow up on something that you said. So you said before that the sensitivity in, in uh, magnitude is limited by the baseline, by the by the size of the baseline that, uh, that we have. So if we were to use, for example, instead of giving an array with uh, small size telescopes, giving an array with large size telescopes, wouldn't we be able to improve? No, of course it would be what crazy, I mean? crazily expensive, but... <laughs> no, no, no. So, so sensitivity does not improve with baseline. Uh, what I meant is that for reaching um, good sensitivity with the baselines that you would need for extragalactic sources, like going uh, into the micro arc second resolution regime that you would need for extragalactic sources, uh, then the only way to reach the required sensitivity with those large baselines would be classical optical telescopes. But uh, um, uh, sensitivity is for, for, for these interferometers is given by the amount of photons that you are able to correlate. So uh, the larger the, your telescope, the better. I guess this increasing the, the, the baseline will decrease the, the confusion. Um, but the, so the, the night sky background would be the same for the same pixel. If, if the telescope is the same, then the, our pixels are like this, and that is what fixes it. degrees, and you get an amount of, of night sky background photons. I believe what you mean is that uh, if two telescopes are very close together and you are observing in 
fast optical astronomy mode. Sorry, this is a mess because it's we are talking about interferometry, about fast optical astronomy. This is, this is hard. So when you are observing in millisecond time ranges, if you have two telescopes that are together, the two telescopes will see the same fluctuations. When you separate them, why, why the same fluctuations? Because you are observing the same atmosphere, the same se convective cell of the atmosphere that is moving a slightly a speckle of light into a given direction. If you separate the telescopes enough so that the atmosphere that they see is different, then the noise that they are measuring is independent. And therefore, you are statistically reducing it by a square root of n. Um, but in interferometry, <laughs> in interferometry, it doesn't matter because the, the atmosphere is really not adding much of a problem. As you are observing in nanosecond timescales and you are correlating the, the, the time of arrival of photons arriving individually into two different telescopes separated by a given distance, doesn't matter what happens with the atmosphere. The important thing is that photons with the same wavelength arrive exactly at the same time uh, in, in both detectors. It's, it's very complicated, <laughs> but um, it only improves in the case of fast optical detectors. There is another question from Miguel Pertorre. Uh, could you remind again the limiting magnitude in G to determine the stellar sizes? Can you repeat, sorry? The, the limiting magnitude in G to determine the stellar sizes. In what? In you. In you. Ah, sorry, sorry, in you, in you. So in you, in you band. Okay, sorry. So um, in U or in B, uh, our our so uh, the wavelength that we are observing is 420 uh, uh, nanometers right now. So uh, in that wavelength, what we are now roughly observing is magnitude four. We can probably go slightly beyond that. Okay, so we can probably reach 4.5 with enough observing time. Uh, and as soon as we add the, uh, if we added the large size telescope prototype mm -hmm. and we are able to perform interferometric measurements with it, then we are expected that to improve by a, a, unit, a unit at least. Yeah. So that, this means that in the, in the short time scales, we, we will reach roughly magnitude five or even magnitude six with, with LST. The, the grant that I got is to equip the four future LSTs. This means that when, when we start correlating a large size telescope with other large size telescopes, the, we again expect to improve another magnitude. Therefore, we are starting to reach the six, seven uh, magnitude range that starts being much more attractive because it starts being comparable with Chara. But remember that we are performing correlation between each telescope versus each telescope. Therefore, the number of correlations is n times n minus one divided by two, which is a high number of correlations. Okay, last one. <laughs> I have two nice questions. Uh, only one. Yes. Where do you have a W shape there in the occultation instead of a classical box shape? This is diffraction, pure diffraction. So, so the light from stars is roughly a laser, no? So, uh -huh. so, um, uh, and then, um, so you have a laser. And the Kuiper belt object is tiny, actually smaller than the actual disk of the star. No? Mm -hmm. So, so essentially, what is happening is that the that the diffraction pattern from ingress is is um, is uh, mixing up with the diffraction pattern of the egress. Is something is a it's a okay. it's a mess of Bessel functions, <laughs> and and then it also depends on what is the offset between the between the object and the star. And these shapes change a lot and also change with, with wavelength, et cetera. The interesting thing about this, I will just use your question to say something fun, is that by measuring this, uh, we know at which distance it is, independently to its size. So this means that the, if we are actually able to reconstruct nicely the diffraction pattern, there is no question that what we're observing is a Kuiper belt object. So, so the doubts on these measurements coming from, the, from, from these guys here that the community does have uh, would be vanished. But if we see nothing, then it would be, uh, the, the upper limits that we would achieve here are, are strong. And therefore what I believe is that we would be able to essentially uh, reject some of these observations. The very last, very last one, I promise. <laughs> Is it, uh, I'm not familiar with this kind of telescope, so I don't know which is different between the different channels that you were showing, because you showed that there are four different channels, 
for oh. telescopes. Ah, oh, because, okay, it's a challenge <laughs> for each telescope. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So it's not like hypercam that you can yeah, simultaneously. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So actually, so uh, two years ago, I submitted another ERC proposal that I did not get. And in that one, I was going way more aggressively, uh, um, suggesting that what we could do is to have several uh, uh, colors uh, doing something similar to hypercam, like like with with Dicrox separating the optical beam mm -hmm. and throwing the different different um, wavelengths to different pixels. No, so then we could have uh, shapes like this one for different colors. And when you have that, then it's very interesting because the diffraction pattern changes with with the with the wavelength. So uh, you can do very interesting stuff uh, uh, when when you have that. No, um, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, so there is uh, nothing else. Uh, thank you very much again, Harry, for the presentation. And, uh, Shall I close this? You can. Okay. <laughs>